front and then I'm going to click broadcast. You ready? I am. I reckon we uh, will be close to maxing this one out. So I, am. Um, I know you'll be great. Have a good one. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Thanks, for, thanks for inviting me to do no this. I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Broadcast. All right. Click to broadcast. Now, a whole bunch of people are going to start turning up. They're coming in, I can see. Uh, they're coming in. in. There's Adrian, Deddy, Varsha, Emily. And I won't keep doing this for everyone. It's a bit like um, Romper Room, if you remember that show where Miss Helena. I do. I can see you. I was waiting for magic. my name. Well, I was on the New Zealand version in the late 70s when I was in kindergarten. We had Miss no Helena way. as well. Hi, John Farrow. John, John's been coming to heaps. He said hello in the chat. John so is yeah, enriching everyone, himself. Yeah, yeah. Feel free, everyone, to um, say hello in the chat. Um, be aware that uh, the default is just to send it to all the panelists. So, if you want to interact with the other folks who are uh, here in the audience, then select the drop down all panelists and attendees. So I'm going to say hi all in there, and Simon here is ready for you. He's um, in, in Caulfield South. Is that right? yeah. And I'm here in Clifton Hill and we're, we're both on the um, traditional land of the Wurundjeri people. So I like to acknowledge the elders past and present. Um, that may be different for where you are, but um, not knowing exactly where you are, uh, can't be specific. So uh, we've done probably at least 10 of these this week and um, Simon's uh, been, been a very popular one. So um, more people keep flooding, flooding in. So I'll, I'll point out a couple of things as we're doing that. Um, the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom interface is a place which is good for you to put in questions as they come along. And it'll be up to Simon as to how you want to handle that, either as we go through at various points or at the end or blah, blah, blah. Try blah. and pick them up. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. Um, uh, there's, I, I might pop up a couple of polls, just ask where you are and that type of thing as we go along too. So that'll appear as we go along. So um, yeah, general chat in the chat window, um, it's easier in the Q and uh, to put questions, specific questions in the Q and A, but we will, I'll keep monitoring the, the, um, the uh, chat window as well for later on. Um, this is, I tried uh, making Facebook Live happen and I'm pretty sure it actually worked this time. I've been very uh, hit and miss about getting this to work. So pretty sure we're on Facebook Live right now also. So um, as we go along, I'll um, do a few tweets and stuff about that. So, all right. So Simon, 2015, came uh, and spoke and was, was the stars of the show uh, at Spark for Change, which if you don't know what it's about, is one of the events that we run which is about meaning for this in work and also society. And uh, that's uh, a, a topic that um, Simon is a very uh, expert in. And um, he's got a, a talk now for us today called Making Bold. So I won't go into his um, CV. I'll let um, Simon do that himself and let you know what he's all about uh, as we go through uh, the next bit with him. So thanks very much, Simon. That is awesome, Ed. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Great to, uh, great to meet you through this wonderful virtual platform that we're all part of today. Um, the last conference is definitely going anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. And um, yeah, good day, George. Good to see you. Hello, all those comments. Yeah, so keep those chats coming because I eye on them as we do. And I reckon the chat space is a great place to do two things, to um, react to things as I'm talking, but also to react to each other. So by all means, please have a conversation with each other as you see people's comments, you hear people's questions, feel free to engage. I think this is one of the powers of this platform. Um, and I think this is the sort of platform that people are gonna do, not just for these sorts of uh, virtual conferences, but to do it um, in a live setting as well, to be able to have a back channel like this, a secondary channel, as I call it, for people to have these conversations, because we can, as, as much as possible anyway, we can learn from one another. And um, and yes, if we're, if we're Facebook Live, Ed, I say hello to the world. 
um, all hundreds and thousands of you who have just instantly tuned in now. Uh, so let's um, let's kick off. Making bold session um, over the next hour is all about uh, creating the conditions for teams to thrive. Uh, and I, I, I kind of want to acknowledge that for a lot of people right now, there might even be a slight jarring on that word thrive. Um, because for many, it might be when they look at it, they think right now, I think really my main focus, Simon, if you don't mind, is actually just survive. Uh, when so many adjustments at the moment, things have been upended. We feel like we're in a kind of proverbial washing machine at the moment. Um, just finding our feet some days of the week is the real challenge. Uh, so we'll just stick with that if you don't mind. Um, but look, I think there is a key element to what I want to talk about in this next hour around how do we help teams that might, for the first time ever, be first, first physically, um, and suddenly finding themselves working virtually. I know a lot of you who are on this or watching this now are perhaps more accustomed to working in that format than others. But I think there's a lot in the theme of today that is really about how do we create some of those kinds of conditions where those teams, physically dispersed, can really find their rhythm and their hum. And that, for me, for those I haven't met before, um, that, for me, is the, the epicentre of my work, which is the, the whole piece around how do we create teams that truly hum, really collaborative teams. Uh, and that's my that's the focus in everything that I do. Actually, my, my own journey to this and the whole notion of making bold came from perhaps my own history, which I'll give a very quick sort of potted summary of this. I started off my career back in the mid 90s in the day of law. Um, I started my career as a commercial lawyer um, and worked for about five or six years in a uh, this law firm setting. And in that space, it was very much sit in your box, do your work in six minute intervals, stick to your knitting and the like. Oh, we're just getting some uh, feedback on the chat saying the audio is trailing off at times. Not quite sure why that might be. Ed, are you experiencing? Yeah, yeah. for a couple of seconds now and again, but not, not a lot. Hmm, I wonder why that would be. Apologies. Uh, Ed, give me a call out if it keeps happening and I can change my headphones to uh, hardwired ones instead, it's just in few, case. It's happened a few times already, so... Yeah. All right, shall we try it now? Okay. okay. Look at this. Live, in action. People are also saying the video seems to freeze occasionally. I hope that's not the case. Uh, anyhow, let's try this. One second, please. One moment, please. We're going to do this from uh, uh, not Simon's place, where he, he had a worse connection. So he uh, he drove a couple of hours to, to get to a good connection. To do this, yeah. Can you hear me all right now? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let's give that a crack. I probably can't do much about the uh, the video if, if it's uh, Netflix right now, perhaps. Um, oh, excellent. Thank you, George, for that feedback. He's saying it sounds better and clearer. Well, Jürgen's not so, so sure. Anyhow, let me, let me continue on. Let me soldier on for the moment, see how we go. So I was talking about um, my background as a commercial lawyer. And in that world, it was very much stick to your knitting, stick to your box, work in your little space and don't stick your neck out to... And it was such a world of no place. Um, at the same time, so I had not just studied law, I had studied a Bachelor of Performing Arts at uni. And in that world, um, I had kind of got involved in different kind of performance. But because I was so busy lawyering away, I ended up in the world of improvised theatre. And I don't know if anyone's ever seen any improv before, but I'm talking about um, popular shows like uh, theatre sports and other formats where you are getting up in front of an audience and performing live. Um, making stuff up on the spot, absolutely no script. And in that world, um, I think the experience was that you had to learn to make bold. You had to learn very quickly to jump in with courage and to participate with courage as a player. And I think a lot of people look at improvisers and go, oh, so you're an improviser. You're one of those crazy extroverts who just loves jumping on stage in front of people. Well, I have to say that's not my natural disposition. And the experience of performing an improv, and it's why I fell in love with it, and it's why I love it to this day, 
is that it trained me and built up, if you like, the capacity for not just individual courage, but in the context of a performing ensemble, a troupe, we built up what I would call collective courage. And we would workshop once a week, we'd come together and we would practice things and we would learn skills and we would try things out and develop these practices that had effectively enabled us as a team to jump on stage and do some crazy shit, right? You know, we would, but we would have one another's backs all the time. And it was that that enabled an improvisation troupe to truly shine. Occasionally I would perform in groups and, and still do where you may not know the other performers all that well, and you don't feel that safe. You don't feel that people have your back, but they might be more focused on being the best performer they can be rather than looking after you as a team. And it's in those situations that you find yourself as a performer kind of shrinking and not bringing your best. And so for me, the thing that I have become really fascinated about is how to, how to take these conditions where everyone can bring their best to truly thrive. And I'm really inspired by a quote here that some of you may have seen before. It's from Walter Riston, who was a long-term CEO of Citigroup, it's now Citigroup, um, back from 1967 to 1984. The person who figures out how to harness the collective genius of his or her organisation is going to blow the competition away. I love this. The idea that on paper, and I think we all know it, that if I look at my team, we have the Avengers assembled. We have the absolute uh, Justice League, whichever your preference is. But if you look at it on paper and you look at the individual skills, that's kind of not enough. We need to work out how do we harness the collective genius of this group of people so that together they can do the extraordinary, not just individually. I reckon this is the little code that every organisation and every team is constantly trying to crack. So in this session, I want to explore this through the lens of what does it take to create that level of boldness or collective courage that allows people to bring that? And here's my question to you to kick us off, just a little bit of a thought. When you see this word bold, what's your reaction to it? And particularly, what does it conjure up? For you, are there particular images? Are there particular reactions? Are there particular qualities? Is it a negative? Is it a positive reaction? Is it an experience? Jump into the chat room and just jot down whatever comes to mind. What does this word bold conjure up for you? Keandra says a bold font. Yep, of course. Innovation, says Ross. Courageous. Aggression, but in a positive way. I love that. Um, super deep. Fearless. Bro positive, risky, putting it there. That's great. I love that. George, brave, assertive, new steps, stepping out of your comfort zone. Courage is coming a lot. Um, proactive, fearless, going for it. Challenging a wrong decision. Yeah, I think this, and you know, how important is this right now um, in terms of the context of what's going on around us? You just hope that there are people who are bold enough to challenge thinking that might be flawed, to challenge data. It's mainstream not because the quality of decisions being made every day depends on this kind of collective genius that might exist within our um, key agencies, health departments and, and the like. Leading from the front, going out of your comfort zone, be someone who's not a group thinker, standing on your own, taking risks, relent. Oh, I love that, Sandra. Relentless collaboration to achieve team goals, relentless and being prepared to decisions. Cool stuff there. And I think, you know, as we think of this word bold, and most of that actually seems like a fairly positive association with the word bold, because uh, it does conjure up different things for different people. For some people, they talk about colours. They think of bold, bright colours. Um, uh, we already had the joke about uh, it, it's bold. It's great for emphasis. Although for some people, bold is never quite enough, is it? I've got to kind of go all the way. In fact, you can't go all the way unless you've thrown some emojis in, can you? Got to have emojis, be truly bold. Uh, the bold and the beautiful, I'm glad no one came up with that because it could be something that you're obsessing about right now. Um, there's plenty of time for some of us to be watching this at the moment. Um, and then, of course, fashion choices, colours, the choices we make in terms of how we show up. Elton John is a name that often people throw up at this point. Um, Lady Gaga often comes up in this thread when I ask people what do they think of when they think of bold. And when it comes to fashion choices, you know who one of the most common names is that comes up? Yeah, that's right. Prince Philip, um, particularly for his willingness to wear that hat. That is bold. Um, 
So bold conjures up a whole bunch of different reactions. But of course, in the context of what we're talking about, the context of teams, all jokes aside, here's the way I like to frame it. How do we create the conditions for people to, four things. Firstly, bring their full selves to the table. So when I rock into a meeting or I jump onto a call um, or I just turn up into the team, do I bring every aspect of what I have to bring into that space? Is it safe to do so? Or do I fear negative repercussions from that? Own our challenges, own our goals together, a collective shared sense of ownership and our circumstances around us, everything that is happening around us. Are we able to lean forward in the face of discomfort? Um, do we embrace challenge? Are we relentless even when the headwinds are against us? Do we find ourselves when someone raises something that feels a little bit prickly and rather than backing down at that point, we are prepared to continue on, stay on the front foot, even though it might feel socially uncomfortable? And finally, are we able to do extraordinary things together? So do we harness, if you like, our wonder twin powers and discover this ability to harness strengths. Decisions collect, create space for everybody's voice, everybody's strengths, everybody's insight and perspectives and adjusting along the way. This is what I think of as bold and it's a handy acronym, sure, but the real challenge is how do we get to all those four places? I'll just pause for a moment and just ask Ed, how's it tracking from a, um, quality point of view, video and audio? It's generally okay. Once in a while it stops for a second or so, but it's, it's not too bad. Apologies, folks. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm on top speed NBN with my new Google Nest uh, <laughs> router and apparently that's still causing us issues. So apologies. Um, so let's lean forward in the face of discomfort at this point. I think when it comes to then this question of how people tell me about. Hey Nosh, good to see you. Um, one of the things some people talk about is that, yeah, I feel like there is often an association with this idea of, yeah, as a team, as an organisation, we have to be bold, which starts to have connotations of feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. You know, suck it up, have some courage, put your fears aside. Good. So having bold simply as a value stuck up on a poster on a wall is far from enough, far from enough. Um, and I was having a conversation with somebody about this just a couple of months ago at a conference in person, remember those days? Um, and she was saying, yeah, we actually had this very experiment, Simon, where in our organisation we adopted bold as a value and it suddenly felt like there was this expectation that everyone would just start giving assertive feedback. They would start voicing up in meetings, but not really an allowance for the fact that for some of us, that was a really uncomfortable thing to do. In fact, some of us didn't even feel like we had the skills to do it effectively. And so I'm not sure we ever created the conditions for us to get to this. And I think that's, that's a dangerous place. It's where teams, I think, have to be careful that this idea of bold doesn't mean you're just instantly going to switch on because we all have permission to be bold. Brave hard style across. The mountain. So the shift that we're making is talking less about being bold and I think towards making bold. How do we create the conditions and build up the muscles? Because that's exactly what it is. This is a muscle to build that enables us to do things that don't feel comfortable and normal. Bang on, says Daniel. Um, for some of us, and I imagine you can think of it all, to just reflect on this for a moment. I want you to think about a moment where, or a t rather a context where, you have absolutely shone. So the team, the environment, the meeting, the relationship, whatever it was, enabled you to really be the full version of yourself. I had no reservation, no censorship going on. I could just be me. People got to see the full version of me. So just take a moment to think of a situation for you where you have really shone in that 
you're welcome to bung this in chat. I hope I'm not putting that as an expectation if you want to share those. And then by contrast, I'd invite you to think about what about the situations where you have shrunk? In other words, where you have been the less than full version of yourself for whatever reason. So for me, for example, if I go into a meeting that is intensely, uh, I can think of one client that I'm working with, it's an executive team. I'm in their organization in my capacity as a, a coach to that team. And yet if in that situation I step not yet been the conditions created for us to do good work and there is a real um, seriousness a real earnestness you can almost feel the sweat on everyone's brows in that room my instinct in those situations is to shrink to pull my head in to pull my neck in to pull my neck down because i am a safety seeker like all of us we are seeking safety all the time and safety equates to not get too far above the line. So the shine versus shrink condition, what, what are those differences for you? Does anyone know where this picture is from, by the way, that we're looking at on the screen? It's from TV, TV show slash movie. Anyone know? Pop it in the chat if you know. It's the incredible shrinking man. Spoils, spoils it for you. Incredible shrinking man, not land up at this. So how do we create the conditions where our team? Yeah, I love that. Um, Superdeep says, I'm a safety seeker. I like it. And a happiness seeker. And humans are generally, we look for the opportunity or we look for ways to stay safe through happiness, um, creating the conditions where people aren't frowning. They aren't upset at us. Now, here's the challenge, right? We've all got, and not just us, but our teams. When I jump on my web call, team, mixed tape. What's the mixed tape? That is playing through our heads and the mixtape here is something we put together back in the 80s right it might have been a mixtape that we assembled back when we were a young kid i don't know if the 80s is the right time frame for you maybe it's the 70s maybe it's the 60s maybe it's the 90s maybe some of you are going what the hell is a mixtape mixtape although thanks thanks to gardens of the galaxy most of us do now now know i think um we've got this mixtape over now the greatest hits just keep singing over and over because it's like an earworm. It just got in, right? And it's two-sided, says Nosh. Um, and it's got hits on it, such as, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Um, or, that's not the way we do things around here. Sorry, I'm singing now. Not sure I was fully expecting to sing, but I am. That's not the way we do things around here. Or, don't go ruffling feathers. I couldn't if I tried. So don't go ruffling feathers. Yeah, don't, don't go upsetting people who have been here longer than you or who know more than you do or who are more senior than you in this organisation. Or who do you think you are? Um, you can see by some of the tunes I'm using that I'm dating myself totally here. Uh, and then... Comes back to the... Pick me! Me! I still want to be on that team. <laughs> so we've all got this mixed tape that's stuck in our head. And I wonder what the tune is for you that can easily get in the way. I think, you know, when I think of the mixed tape, I think of moments in my, my life where these songs have been totally imprinted. Oh, thanks, Nosh. That's beautiful. Andra says, yeah, I got a five playlist. Well, and in fact, I think that's the opportunity here. The opportunity here is to say, Let's wipe this mixtape because we now have the capacity, Spotify-like, to just mix it up. We get to choose our playlists every day. We have access to so many things. Uh, so let's just play. Um, and I have this, you know, this memory as a kid when I was, I was doing a performance. Remember why? It was at a, um, a family gathering, a big event. Maybe it was Christmas. Maybe it was a birthday. I don't know. Um, and we were doing this performance, a few of us, maybe my, my younger brothers and my cousins. And there were a couple of people sitting in the room who, while we were performing, were kind of leaning over to each other and muttering and laughing. And I remember the story I attributed to that moment was they're laughing at me. Laughing at me. And I think I've gone too far. And when I think about it, that was a moment where I recorded something on my mixtape. And it's so powerful being aware of that. 
but it's also now powerful being able to think, well, it, does that serve me? No, nah, let's wipe that, wipe that shit. Go to the Spotify playlist. Um, thank you, Lisa. Lisa says I can sing. Oh, that's nice. So what does it take to get to this place? What, what I want to do is jive in to some of these ideas, what I call five practices. And the practices are all about building a team muscle, getting to a place where we can work up to a state of collective courage. Like there's this leadership program I do with, um, with one group and I've done it for the last six years. It's a joy to work on. But one of the elements of the program is they have a ropes course. And I know some people might think, oh my God, a ropes course. And that was my reaction too. Like who, who wants a ropes course? So 80s. But actually the thing I love about this ropes course is that the consistent experience is as you rock up to us, there's 20 odd people in the program. There, you watch some people who just clamber straight up the ladder once everything's set up. They clamber up the ladder. They can't wait to get up high. They're across all five elements. They've smashed us. They are the monkeys in the group. And meanwhile, everyone else is down on the ground looking, going, oh my God, I just so can't even imagine getting to rung four on that ladder. And it's fascinating to watch the team dynamics as you see those differences. But then as a facilitator in that situation, to help the team recognize this huge spectrum in their group of reaction. It's a fear that is playing out at that moment. And to encourage people in the group to say, hey, what is our collective level of fear right now? And from that, what will it take for us to develop a collective sense of courage? And the team talks there about some of the ways they can help and encourage and um, coach people, if you like, into that state where we can. As a team, we can make bold together as a team. And I love that. I love that. So this is exactly what I want to talk about now. How do we develop that collective courage in any team? And I think of this through five key practices, which you'll see there up on the screen. Now, and I'll tell you a little later, I'm going to give you access to a summary card of this. So if you want that with some little notes attached to them, um, you can grab a um, But what I want to do is over the course of our time together, just have a look at each of these five quickly and also um, give you a space to kind of ask questions or share your own perspectives on these as we go. As Ed said, if you've got questions or things you want me to pick up on as we go, just throw them in the chat or into the Q&A box as well, which Ed is monitoring. So five practices. Of... Key here is to remind your team that this is a, a set of practices that won't lead to instance, an instant level of collective courage, just like my yoga practice at the moment. I've been for the last three months rocking up on a daily basis to my yoga mat, thank goodness, um, following someone online to do these classes uh, and it's keeping me sane right now. I did not know when I started that yoga practice that it would be possible for me to fix a shoulder problem three years. I did not know that it would be possible for me, not quite yet, but almost touch my toes. I did not know it would be possible for me to overcome a problem I had in my hip for the last 18 months. And yet all of these things have emerged as wonderful outcomes now of nearly three months of yoga. And I think the key to remind ourselves is you don't achieve the outcome on day one. It takes time to develop practice and rituals. So let's have a look at it. The first practice is what I like to call Abe's rule, but it essentially is always be experimenting always be experimenting um, and always be experimenting is this wonderful antidote for the fact that we as human beings are pattern seekers, pattern seekers. We love a good pattern. Because it is hardwired. Always be closing, says Ed. Not quite. <laughs> um, it is hardwired into us that if we can detect patterns and predict them, then what we can also do is conform to those patterns. And by conforming to patterns is the most surefire way to belong and remain in a tribe. So you pick tribes and communities based on the patterns and our capacity to replicate them. 
And I think that's exactly the case for every team and organisation is that we're constantly seeking patterns within which to be safe and to connect and to feel okay. So as a team, I think for all of us and any leader of a team, the, the encouragement here is to say, how do we create the conditions for people to always be experimenting? And on the road to that, and that's a mindset thing. It's the kind of great tragedy almost that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. Like if I watch my eight year old in the context of all the change that's been going on in our lives over the last three to four weeks, he has probably been the most adaptive because everything's new. It's all fun. Amongst us, there are just too many ways things are done that are ingrained in us to make that easy. So in the expert's mind, there are a few. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are a few. Wonderful Buddhist monk, Shunryo Suzuki. And so what we're trying to do here through the idea of always be experimenting is saying, we've got to build in a default practice here that says we're working against the grain of this. The whole of last anywhere any is an experiment. Like we have all been forced into a giant experiment. So why not make the most of it and treat every day as an opportunity to say, hey, what could I do that is completely off script today by choice? Because there's plenty off script that I'm not choosing right now, but what could I choose to put off script? And if you don't kind of believe me about this in this expert's mind, there are a few. I mean, you don't have to look far, particularly given we're all in a domestic setting at the moment, you don't have to look far to, uh, to know where we have our pattern preferences. And from early on in life, we were ingrained as to what's right and what's wrong. Like, I don't know which of these you sit on, but clearly this picture is correct, right? That the top is the one. Got the paper roll on the bottom. No, no. And yet, in this family, <laughs> this is not the way it rolls. No pun intended. We have to switch them over. Actually, pun was a little bit intended. We have to switch them over regularly because we can't see eye to eye on this. Even though there is clearly an international established standard on this, which I discovered, has anyone ever seen this before? It was a, um, some people were so obsessed by it, but the, a t-shirt was printed. Patent a toilet roll holder on it, which demonstrates the way in which you were supposed to hang the toilet roll. So there you go, proof folks. Joy, says, says George. <laughs> no mucking around. But we all have these patterns. So I think now is the time to be saying, what are my patterns and how can I mess them up a little bit? So entering into this world of what's your daily experiment. Now this could be really small, but the daily experiment for me right now might be as simple as what's the one thing I'm going to do that is completely different today. It could be as small as when I go for a walk this morning, Oh, I didn't go for a walk this morning because I got up early for a drive. But when I went for a walk yesterday morning, to actually walk the opposite direction around the block than the way I normally would walk. Now, that doesn't seem like a big thing, right? Ways to them, it's start rewire this chip within us that just seeks default all the time. Now, we can ratchet that up a little bit. So, well, I would normally sit on this side of the desk. How about... I flip onto the other side of the desk. Um, it could be, well, we normally use Zoom for our team meetings. Why don't we try something different today? I don't know if it'll work well, um, but, uh, but we can flip it over. Um, let's give it a little go. Um, Nosh is just asking a question. I just sort of picked up a question here in the box that when your boss doesn't think your experiment is good, how do you change their mindset? I think that's a fabulous question, Nosh. I think that. The challenge here is we've got this intersection between I'm experimenting and I've got someone else who's evaluating it. Experiment is to say, how do we make this small enough, light enough, discreet enough to say, what if we were just to give it a try, even if it were for only an hour, even if it were for only half a day? Um, and that's the opportunity, I think, to ask perhaps your boss or a colleague or a team member to say, what's the shortest possible experiment that we could run here that would at least allow us to run it, but without us feeling like we're crashing into each other? So I think that for me ties into my next slide here, which is actually, what's your language of experimentation? 
So if you're thinking, I want to run an experiment, but actually what you're doing is talking about the, hey, let's set up a whole new structure for our team and maybe it only needs to go for a few months, but let's uh, you know, change the way in which the reporting lines work or the way in which we're collecting data or let's mix up our weekly cadence. Maybe the language piece you've got to insert into here is, hey, I just want to give something a try and it could, it could be idea maybe that's okay because the worst thing that could happen here is we learn something from it what are we trying this week and I, I would encourage you always to adopt this language of try and this energy of delight about experimentation so I'll give you a quick example of what I mean by that I was um, uh, doing some work late last year in a program which we had designed out with the client and we were running according to the design and we're always adapting things on the fly but my client was sitting in the room with me and at one of the breaks she said i was just looking at the design here some and i wondered rather than facilitating the conversation in this way could we perhaps mix it up and do it this way instead and i looked at her and i looked at my watch and i thought god we've before we have to come to break and i said to her look i guess we could do it that way but I wonder whether or not, you know, we've really thought through the way in which the other way will go. And I, I guess we don't know how this way would actually run. So you can see what I'm doing, right? I'm trying to cling back to pattern. And her reaction to me was, I know, isn't it fabulous? So in the, in the, in the, face of the idea of we don't know how this is going to go, her reaction was, I know, isn't that fabulous? And I think we've got to adopt this kind of language and energy that says, yeah, experimenting things is just such a joyful thing. Let's do it. Let's give it a crack. So staying upbeat and keeping up light all the time. But I think the other thing we know um, around this is that if we're going to adopt an experiment, the flip side of this second practice as well, which is what I like to call stuff up with style or as some people like to call it, fuck up with flair, if you'll excuse the French. Stuff up with style. And stuff up with style is all around our language and our attitude towards making mistakes and how we go with that, both individually and as a team. So as improvisers, one of the games that we play, and we play it a lot, is we play quick directing the game we might have to make a story one word up at a time the person directing the game says faster faster take some risks take take some risks i want to hear people actually making mistakes and then what we're encouraged to do is to throw our hands up in the air when we do make a mistake when things go wrong and declare at the top of our voice i made a mistake and everyone claps in response to that now that's a practice that improvisers work on routinely in order to train ourselves out of the fear of being found out, the fear of being the first to make a mistake, the fear of saying, well, I'm, I'm stuffing up with style, but actually being the one who made a stupid mistake. We actually have to completely disrupt that by encouraging this energy of how do we actually celebrate mistakes around here? Um, thinking in your own team context, how we might do that and Manven, question in there, I'll for that in a sec. I guess is again going to come to your language. So when we talk about experiments, I think the first thing we have to remind ourselves is, you know what's cool about running an experiment? Is that we are going to stuff up. There are going to be mistakes. I don't know, maybe every 10 things we try, there'll be nine stuff ups. And that's cool because the best thing about growth is that it comes one fuck up at a time. This is a And again, sorry, I've gone all that. But the best growth is that it comes one F up at a time. And it's apologies to Abraham Lincoln, who said the best thing about the future is it comes one day at a time. So that means we should hardwire in an expectation of those stuff ups and mistakes. Um, because there are plenty of examples in history of whether it's WD. J.K. Jalen with her repetitive need, uh, attempts to try and launch Harry Potter and it took years to do it, um, over a decade. We've got um, you know, bubble wrap, which was eventually wallpaper. All of these examples that show if they hadn't stuffed up 10, 15, 20 or more times, or in WD-40's case, 39 times to get to the final success, they wouldn't have got to where they wanted to. So what I... Got to learn to boogie on the... 
cutting room floor. And boogie on the cutting room floor is if you can picture this. So this, this came from a group I was working with and they were putting together a plan for their next three months as a team and how they were going to approach things. And what they did was they had three posters set up on the wall as they were brainstorming out how they were going to approach the next three months. And the first poster was, um, fed it. And right was all ideas, anything that you think could go in there, just put them up, all comers are welcome. And then the third and final poster was final cut. And the final cut was what is our final version of the experiment we want to run for the next three months? Let's get that up. But then the middle poster, which was the most critical of the lot, was the cutting room floor. So to final things either had to go onto the cutting room floor or onto the final edit. But here was the real goal, was that when things did move onto the cutting room floor, they got applause. The leader of this team or other members of the team were encouraged to essentially call out a big thank you and an appreciation for thank you for coming up for that idea because it meant that we get the stuff on the final cut. I all know this since you were... So as a team, celebrate those failures by boogieing on the cutting room floor. All great examples of stuffing up with style. And the final part of this is similarly to the, what's your language of experimentation? It's your language of stuffing up. So I gave the improvisers example of, I made a mistake, woo! -hoo! And being able to do that, like you could play that game in team workshops. It's a bit like Benjamin Zander, the um, conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra uh, and the author, co-author of a wonderful, wonderful book called The Art of Possibility, um, tells this, well, not just a story, but a lesson of how in response to any mistake that happens when he's conducting an orchestra that trombone blows a bad note or the strings come in early um, or the one too many beats and one standing there red faced his response which he's coached into himself and he's a big you know tall english gentleman he says how fascinating how fascinating and everyone laughs and then it's an opportunity to say so what do we learn from that again it's an attitude piece Stuff up with style. Manvendra, you asked the question, how do we embed these practices in the organisational rhythm? Make, how to make a decision. I think the question is absolute goal. Essentially, what these practices represent is a commitment. So I think as a team, you have to first have a conversation, and maybe we can come back to this at the end, is which of these practices are useful to us? How do they serve us? Let's agree first as a team, how many of these five or other practices do we want to adopt to build a muscle? How long do we want to do it for? And looks like in practice for us as a team over the next 90 days. Might not be perfect, let's run it as an experiment. Maybe it's not 90 days, maybe it's two weeks. Um, but coming back and having that question as a team and owning it together is absolute key. So don't try and nail this. I think it's about looking into this and saying, which of these feel useful to us and therefore how could we try them? But let's maybe even come back to that. The next practice. Uh, diverge before deciding. Now, diverge before deciding. Edward de Bono used to talk about the black hat and still does, and it's a powerful tool in the context of the six thinking hats, which you may be familiar with. Absolutely nails the idea that for many of us, the instinct is to avoid conflict or to certainly not provide dissent until we've been given really clear permission to do it, or there are others doing it. It's a pattern. So as a result, there's always a few in a team who are kind of more confident about doing this. But diverge before deciding is creating the space where it doesn't just become an invitation, it becomes an expectation that we will spend time disagreeing, dissenting, busting open ideas, throwing alternative perspectives onto the table. Much in the same way that the Pope papal selection process came up with the whole concept of the devil's advocate as a built-in part of the process. How do we build that into our own team process? processes. So the invitation here is not, not to just invite dissent, but to expect it. So as a facilitator, I know that if I sit at the front of the team and say, let's just pause at this moment and just take a few minutes. If anyone has a different point of view on this or anyone wants to take issue or disagree with anything in the room, let's create some space now for that. I could sit there 
and listen to the crickets for the next 10 seconds and put my hand on my heart and say, well, at least I gave them the opportunity. Well, if I looked at this, I would say, hang on, no, you invited dissent, but you didn't expect it. So what I would be saying is in this context or any similar situation, you want to say, all right, I reckon for the next 10 minutes, we need to actually kind of look at the ideas so far or the conversations so far and ask ourselves, what do we disagree with so far? Or what views haven't we explored yet? Let's take the next 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is, and come up with at least six of those in the room. So let's maybe go away either individually or maybe into pairs or go off and call someone if you're on a Zoom call and take 10 minutes to come up with at least one in each pair and then let's bring them back. But let's agree we won't move on till we've got at least six as a group. In other words, I am creating space for mess and building in this hardwired expectation of dissent and disagreement. Um, Sean's asking a great question here around how important all this might from seeing a leader be a strategies can we employ to influence up and influence this culture change? I, I do think there's a really important interaction here between the culture of an organisation and its willingness to tolerate dissent and disagreement. Uh, and indeed the whole concept of invention, experimentation and the like. I think the first opportunity for a team, and I think this starts with you, is to say, hey, environment where we can experiment within the construct. In other words, experiment within the rules that exist already. So if we're stuck to a reporting requirement, that means we've got to report results once a week. How do we experiment within that and see what that creates for us? In other words, I think you have to take your power from your own context because the most powerful way to influence any of this is first of all going to be able to demonstrate how it has helped you to achieve, to achieve change, to achieve um, new levels of thinking, to attract new uh, recruits and talent in the market, whatever it might be. So I think the first part to this is to become a case study yourself. So seek to be that case study. Much in the same way Steve Jobs did originally when he whole set up the let's be pirates concept um, in order to develop uh, his team. Deliberately kind of broke himself off, ultimately got fired as a result. But the, the challenge there is to say, actually, once we become a working model, people look to it and go, we need that to deploy. So become a case study yourself first. I might come back to if we've got time at the end around other strategies to influence on this as well, see if we can come up with some other ideas in the room. Let me go to the next of the five practices, which is cue them in. So the best way I think I can come to, I mean, again, facilitation is a big part of my work. And cue them in, which is always strange in this environment, is to actually develop the skill, not just yourself, but to create the skill amongst your team where you are actively encouraging others in the room to point to others who haven't yet spoken and say, I would be interested in your thoughts, Chris. I would be interested in your thoughts, Lisa. We haven't heard from Yogam for a bit. I'd love to know what Yogam thinks on this. And to create the conditions where that becomes, again, the norm and the expectation. Now, as a facilitator, one thing I sometimes do is one who's ill and there's others who are quiet in the room, I might say to the person, um, hey, Lisa, sorry, Lisa, I'm not suggesting your vocal. <laughs> Let me make up a name at this point. I was trying to make a name up and I, Lisa came to mind. Hey, Simon, that's a safe one because that's me. Hey, Simon, um, who would you like to hear from on this that we haven't yet heard from? And you could do that to an individual. You could do it with each other. Hey, who do we want to hear from on this that we haven't yet heard from? But more and more as you do that as a team, yeah the environment where that we all do. Improvisers train really hard on this because the instinct for a lot of improvisers is you jump on stage and you want to perform. You've got your stage time. You want to do your shtick on front, in front of your audience on the stage. But in fact, improvisers learn this capacity to actually make eye contact with others on the team. And we workshop this. We drill this eye contact with others. 
do something physical, ask someone a question that is effectively saying, hey, you come into the scene now. And they might not even be on the stage. So I might be sitting here on the stage and I might say, oh, wow, look, I think the milkman's just arrived. The milkman? Where did that come from? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're going to get back to the milkman in the whole of this world. <laughs> the milkman's just arrived. Look, the milkman's just arrived. And that's the way. Or what sometimes people will do backstage before we go on in a scene is to walk up to others and say, I want you to play a um, young, low status character today. Or I want you to play a senior high status character. Or I want you to play someone with a different accent today. And it's a way of actually encouraging one another to say, hey, I'd love to hear from you or see you because this is your thing today. I want you to see, see you, you know, keep someone else to do a song. So we're cueing each other and encouraging. And I think that word encouragement is really key here. The coaching that I offer teams around this is how do we create the courage for all, each of us and all of us to encourage? We all have to have the courage to encourage. And that's a nice little catch cry for a team at the... The couple of teams I work with that adopted this as their, one of their kind of rules of the road, their charter, which is we, we all we share the courage to encourage, which is don't be the one sitting there going, oh, I'll just... I'll wait for someone else to invite them in. It's just as well, just as much my job as everyone else. Manvendra is saying, cue them in is even more important, has to be specifically done by team members and facilitators. Yeah, yeah. The more you share it, and specifically, you know, not just, anyone got any questions? Peace. There's a great example of the director, I forget his name, of Saturday Night Live, who at the end of every meeting, a ritual was, as his way of doing this, was to say, all right, we finish with a sweep, which is I want to hear from literally everyone in the room, what's your biggest insight so far? And what question would you leave with this group? Insight and question. And I love that little dynamic of saying, if we haven't yet got to it, voice. So that is cue me. Last but not least is developing the practice of how we can all be the room. And be the room is essentially about all of us being the individual, all of us being responsible for the people who can sit there and say, what kind of meeting do I want this to be? What kind of environment do I want this to be? What kind of conversation do I want this to be? What kind of workshop do I want this to be? and then to be that first. So don't wait for it. I mean, how often are we responsible maybe for rocking up to something and kind of sitting there with our arms crossed or perhaps you know people like this who are going, all right, let's see how this goes. I'm a bit skeptical. Let's see what we've got. So I'm waiting for the room to become something, but I'll just be myself in spite of that. And I think what we're trying to do is create the conditions for everyone to share the question of what kind of room do we want this to be and how will each of us be that? Now, creating those conditions together ties with all of these practices clearly, but it does require, I think, the team to answer a question regularly, whether that's the beginning of any conversation, any meeting. Like there's one group I'm working with who had this conversation uh, last week around now that we're having our virtual meetings, how do we want these meetings to feel? What experience do we want to have of them? And they discussed that as a group and they came up with their top six things on this. Here's another example I'm just putting up on the screen of one I did with a client, which was a, a live workshop late last year. Um, and I said, what, how do you want this room to feel? What do you want the experience of this room to be? And let's get that out. And they came up with these things. We want this to feel like it's always the right time to talk about stuff. If we don't sort but there's some delicate issues that they wanted to lean into and tackle. Be here and nowhere else. This is good. Um, the progress is yours to manage. Sorry, the process is yours to manage. So, you know, this through a conversation, I was coaching them a bit in this, was to say, what kind of conditions are you trying to create in this room right now? It's one thing to come up with this, this kind of poster. It's another thing then to say to each individual in the room, so what will you do to make this happen in the first hour? you make what behavior will you bring how will you, that means we are this from the get-go how will you be this and that's the explicit invitation to be the room so we had some people saying oh well 
I'll be the first person to get my phone and put it outside the room because I want to be here and nowhere else. Someone else said, well, I will be the one who um, checks in around the timing of things over the next hour and checks that everyone's had a say. And we heard some of those. I'm the facilitator of this as much as you are, Simon. There's nothing worse than when everyone kind of delegates facilitation or process management to the leader or to the, the facilitator. I think you've got, to, you've got to share it. So if you're a facilitator, ask them, how will you be the room? Just very quickly, I did this with a family and some of you would have seen this because I put this on an um, email I sent out um, uh, yesterday to my mailing list, which was um, the conversation we had as a family about this so things were baky in week one homeschooling had started i've got two kids 13 year old eight, you know, eight year old um we were all kind of a bit narky with one another because we were stepping into each other's boundaries and smashing into each other's expectations of what we wanted this to be like and so instead of all being the room we were effectively crossing our arms and going you're ruining the room to one another so the conversation we started to have at the table, and this is what happens when you have a facilitator in the house, as some of you will know, was, okay, how do we want this? What's important? Experience. How do we want this experience to involve and include? And we ended up having a conversation that just made it necessary for post-it notes to come out, which I have an infinite supply of. And my two kids took control of the post-it notes and the Sharpies and went wild. And look at some of the brilliant stuff up there. Um, you'll notice none of these are rules. None of these are process commitments. They are all what are the qualities experience of all being at home, not getting coronavirus up at the top, the top left there. But yeah, we want alone time. We want birthdays. We want FaceTime. Oop, gone backwards there. Whoops, sorry. Um, we want uh, exercise daily. We want our health. We want um, blocks of business time, Zen space. We want water and food down the bottom. Look at that. So now what this has meant is that on a regular Hey, how's this going? Not the rules, but how's just being this going? And how do each of us bring it this week? And we go around the table. Sophie, my daughter, what are you going to bring to make this all happen this week? My wife does it, I do it, Sam does it as well. It's gold. So that's an example of what I mean by be the room. And it's the last of those five practices of making bold. And I think the key here yeah, is to look at what are the practices that I've regularly kind of observed as being really powerful to set a team up to over time, gradually, bit by bit, like that yoga stretch, you know, I'm getting closer to touching my toes over time. But if we regularly commit to this as a, as a team, how do we slowly build up our collective courage and our capacity to do things that mean we are bringing our full selves to the table? We are owning our work and our circumstances. We are leaning forward in the face of discomfort and we are doing extraordinary things together because of us. I'd love you to take a moment now to maybe write this down, but I'd love to see them in the chat box, is if you were to say one of these, if you were to pick one of these and say, that practice would be really useful to me or my team right now. So I want you to write, what's that practice? So is it stuff up with style? Is it be the room? Is it diverge before deciding? Which is it? And then maybe try and attach to that, what's the practical thing you're thinking might enable you to do it? Or what's your example of how you would do it? So I've given you lots of examples, but what's yours? So just take a moment now, and I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to just reflect on that in the chat room. So P, you might in, cue them in. And you might add your practical approach for doing it. So we're going to end every conversation with a sweep of the team. Awesome. We're starting to see these come through. So pop them into the chat room. Make sure you've got it set to not just all panellists, but panellists and attendees, if you could, so everyone can see yours. Yeah. We've got Diverge the Room. That's kind of like a nice blend of the two of them. I like that. <laughs> diverge before deciding, be the room at once. Let's just diverge the room. I love it. 
great. We've got some now nice practical crisp methods that people are suggesting for doing it. So not being the sole facilitator, everyone being the facilitator. Yes, so really encouraging people to do that. Oh, now we can, I feel the pace picking up now. We're inspiring each other. Look at this. Stuff up with style risks. Yes, yeah, so Hendra, great tip there. So Abe's rule, always be experimenting. As a team, we decide to rotate facilitators for stand-ups and empowers them to run it differently. Yeah, so that encouragement to say, what's your version of running this? Almost make it an expectation that you can't just run the last meeting agenda. The whole point of sharing it is that you bring your version of it. So what's your different? Even if it's a flop, because we'll stuff up with style. Didn't love it, but applaud you for trying it. Kat says, I'm seeing epic benefits using Be The Room, which we call house rules. We agree at the beginning, which invites and establishes contributor ownership. So cool to hear that. Yeah, that we not just agree them, but we then say, how do each of us step into being that? Um, be The Room. This context says, George, I like the experimenting habit to build, experiment with and queuing. Yeah, I love the question, how do we step in, says Christian. Nice. The Verge before deciding, setting up facilitation of why is this a bad idea? Ah, uh, yeah, Christian's saying, actually build that into the agenda. We need to talk about why this is a bad idea on the assumption that it could well be. And if it's not, whatever comes, we'll withstand it. Okay. Awesome. Okay. How fascinating. So, folks, I'm conscious of time. We're bang on 12.30. Um, we had, um, Ed, a few questions that came through on the way. And hopefully I've been able to respond somewhat to those as well. Um, as people may need to drop off before we formally have closed, I do want to just issue a quick invitation. If anyone, a summary card of that, uh, one of the ways you can grab that is if you could, I've just created a little kind of sign up page on my website, simondowling.com.au slash last. So if you go to that, you can sign up for that summary card. There's a couple of other things on there you can sign up for that may or may not be interested. It's just a ticker box thing that'll come through and I'll shoot it through. But the other thing I would absolutely say is, I mean, short of any other questions we can answer here, I'm happy to hear from you by email. Um, or method is linking. Um, please connect with me um, and ask more questions. I'm happy to keep having this conversation with you. Um, so thank you, Ed. What would what would I'm conscious of time? So do we need to pretty much wrap at this point? Um, yeah, but I mean, I'm quite happy to st stick around and keep yeah, chatting to people. And even um, what what can happen is I can unmute people's mics. So if you're sticking around, you want to I don't know come into the room. Do that. Like there's a, a raise hand feature. So if you, I'm not going to open up everyone because there's probably too many just to open up everyone. But if you um if you're out there and you raise your hand. There's Lisa, I can see that. I don't Lisa. know where that is. Can anyone <laughs> see, see where that is? Oh, there you go, Mavendra. I'll, I'll unmute Mavendra. Hello. Go ahead. Caller. Mavendra. Mavendra. Yeah, it's like live radio, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's something like Mavendra that. online too. Yeah. He's, he, uh, Mavendra's muted right now. I'm just going to some people are dropping away, Ed. So I just want to sort yeah. of formally say thank you so much, everyone, for joining I'll, I'll say that as well. So thanks everyone. Come back again because there's more stuff coming along. Tuesday at the moment is, is uh, there's one. Um, it, when's Ruth? Monday? Lisa? Yeah. Monday we've got a workshop on mindfulness with a really great uh, woman who's based in the English St. Albans, not the Melbourne one. Yeah. Um, sort of towards the end of the day. And she actually does quite a lot of mindfulness sessions online. So uh, we've got that. And then Tuesday, when Nigel Dalton's coming, he's got this talk about um, Ask the Teenagers, which is his latest um, thinking about, about certain things. So anyone else? Uh, I'll lower Menvendra's hand. There you go. Someone's yeah. saying my, my link is wrong. It's actually a lowercase. I didn't realise. Does a link have to... Is it case sensitive, a link? Uh, is it? Um... I have changed it anyway. Uh, Christian says, I'd love to have a copy of everyone's ideas in the web chat. Uh, yeah, I guess we can do that. The chat gets saved. I get saved to my machine. 
when we finish off uh, this session. So we can go and dig it out and I actually think Simon's page. Yeah. I don't know if this is useful, Ed, but I actually think people can save it themselves too. Uh, at their yeah. End. Uh, yep, yep, you might be able to do that too. So uh, just on Facebook Live, I'm going to shut it off, shut off the live video now. Uh, so if you're on chat, folks, at the bottom where you type a message, there's three dots. And yep. there's a click on that, it should say save chat, which means you then get to keep a copy as well. Thanks, Kat. So thanks to everyone on Facebook. Uh, yeah, like uh, you'll also be getting a link to a feedback, a really simple kind of three question feedback. This is as well uh, from Zoom. And yeah, as I was sort of saying during your talk in the chat, this, this whole thing is an experiment and it's going okay so far. I'm quite happy and pleased that I'm uh, providing something and we're providing something that some people are into right now. Some people aren't ready for it yet, but I sent an email out yesterday saying, I want to be, I'll be here. We'll be here when uh, everyone else is ready as well. So mm. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, you quite, yeah, raise your hand if you want to do that. How do you do that? Someone type, please chuck in the chat. How do you do that? Because I can't actually see that. Yeah, I can't see it either. Yeah, Manvendra's raised, Man, Man hands raised again. I have allowed, unmute, I have unmuted you and your microphone is showing. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm. Oh, great. Oh. There you go. Um, um, thanks, thanks, actually. Um, sorry if I asked so many questions. Um, um, Love them. <laughs> uh, I guess um, my curiosity is around uh, when you design a system, um, how you embed some of these practices, um, because um, all these, it's, it's not that different systems can be defined, defined differently. Some is uh, hierarchy based, some are uh, more self-organized. Um, however, um, when you design, my, my thinking is when you design those systems, this become a design principle of its own. That how you make sure the system is bold enough, and everybody or every part of it has a role to play. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, you know, any thoughts or you know, or some of the work that you have done. Um, what has been your experience on that? Yeah. So can I just check, Manvendra, when you say system, what are you referring to? Um. And one example would be designing an organization um, yeah. or, or, you know, setting up a structure to a company or giving a structure or not giving a structure, which is a yeah. conscious decision on its own. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, so when I think of the different um, examples or case studies I see, whether I work with them or not, I, there are three things that really come to mind around how to get this is built into the system. I think building it into the system, was it you who asked the question earlier about senior yes. leadership, do they need to buy in? I think if you're thinking of it at that systems level, you definitely need a sponsor or more who exists in systems-based leadership for the organisation. So I think that's, you, you can either think here of the local systems that we have as a team or the organisational system. So the first piece is, how do I start small and connect with the right stakeholders to encourage them to run this as an experiment. Now we talk about the language of experimentation. The, the little heartbeat that always goes off for me is the fear that when people hear words like system, systems design, that they think that this is lasting, hardwire everything from the get go. So it can, it can freak people out when you start talking about systems. So I would perhaps discourage in the, at the outset of even using that language and say, let's just try some and you know whether it's new rituals or adopt a few little kind of experimental practices to see what works um you was doing it when they were about to set up the kind of the garage uh, business in the backyard just as a way of taking it offline and disconnecting it with the whole system so that's the first thing be careful of your language as well um the the second thing i would say is it's all about then cadence um, is going to be critical. So what are the rituals or the cadence and the rhythms that we use internally that mirror to some of these things? So when in our weekly ritual do we explicitly in people, like teams, to declare and log an experiment that they are running? So 
there's one organisation I've done some work with where part of their walls where they do a stand up is each team declares their weekly experiment. And it's kind of like the norm across the organisation that everyone's running an experiment. And the thing I love about it is as people walk across the floor, which is obviously not relevant right now, floor of the mess, they actually see what each other's experiments are. So declaring and building that into that, that part of the system. Um, similarly, if we're having a weekly team um, meeting or it, even it's, it's just maybe not relevant for a stand-up, but if we have a, a, a retro um, once a fortnight or any kind of ritualised more in-depth meeting, when on that agenda and how long have we agreed towards divergence before deciding? And if it's not an expected and kind of ritualised part of the agenda, then we know it's not in the system. So cadence. Yep. Um, and then the second one is language. I think organisational language is really critical here. Um, sorry, is that a second or third? The third one is language, which is, um, which is critical. So I think organisations that try to shift their language on some of these practices, try to adopt it and hardwire it into values or brand as well, but clearly there has to be a connect between values and brand and language and intent. Yeah. So um, there's one bank that I know of that shifted to having one of its values as bold, but there really was the disconnect between having that plastered up all over the wall and what was going on at a local level in teams. Um, so I think there has to be a real kind of question around how do we build, if it becomes our language, level and what are the terms that we use and celebrate a lot our, like our internal hashtags then what are we doing to kind of not just embed them but to train them into people's you know DNA and behaviors as well thank you does that help a bit Namendra yes thank you thank Anyone you else? thank Anyone you for else? your questions <laughs> um so I just typed in the chat uh, a link uh, if anyone here isn't on the Tabar slack that we have. There's all different channels there for various topics, but um, a popular one lately has been the remote working channel. And if you can bear to have another Slack team on your Slack interface on the left, um, please join and say hello to, and keep chatting. Uh, we're having a, this is the third one, a Friday Spotify uh, playlist listening party. So what we do is create a collaborative playlist, which anyone can follow and then add tunes to it trying to follow a theme, no doom not a, doom. <laughs> not, not a mixed tape, Ed? It's a bit like a mixed tape, it is. Um, <laughs> today's one is going to be, uh, the theme is a song from where you were born or from your family heritage, a song from the last place you visited, visited or heard a lot of while, while you were there, and your favourite Australian song. You know, one, two or three, you can put it in. I haven't checked it. Uh, I haven't checked it yet, but, and then what we do is we all press play at the same time, about 3.30, and we all listen to the songs in sequence uh, together. Ah. And in the remote working, yeah, in the remote working channel, we either praise or slate the, <laughs> the uh, cho choices or people type in, oh, I put this in because uh, I met my partner when, you know, this is our song and, you know, that type of thing, or... So we have that, and then when the playlist is about done or around five o'clock, whichever comes first, we all jump into um, a video facilitator room, which is a platform a little bit like this, but it's video chat, and then we all have a virtual Friday drink, so whoever turns up. So uh, the way to access that is to join with that Slack link I posted in the channel. So um, there you go. Um, all right, probably wrap it all up now. And say thanks to everyone who stuck around. A few, a few left there. I'll see you on the next one, which is at 1.30, some of you. Um, to others, maybe I'll see you next week or at the Friday drinks. And um, thanks so much to Simon and to Lisa for helping me set this up this whole week. Absolute pleasure. And congrats on this whole initiative. I think uh, it's awesome. We'll keep it's it going. We'll try and keep it going. What the world thanks needs. Very thanks very much. All right. Cheers all. I'm going to end the meeting for all now and um, have a good arvo. Bye.